We're going to embark now on the study of the doctrine of the church. This, of course, will be provided for you in printed uh, material, uh, but uh, this is, of course, just the outline form, and uh, I will be saying a lot more about it than what I have actually printed in the notes. Uh, there are so many different concepts of what the local church is. Um, I guess uh, it's uh, almost 30 years ago now that I personally undertook a two-year study as to what what is the church, what is it supposed to be doing, how is it supposed to be functioning. Everybody and his uncle seemed to have some kind of a concept of what the church is. Some of it is biblically based, some of it uh, takes a verse and, and goes off uh, in some kind of a tangent. For example, you will hear many people say that uh, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them, and that therefore is a, is a concept of a church. That text is a text taken out of context, and it becomes a pretext when it is referred to the church. It has nothing to do with the church. As a matter of fact, it is dealing with the subject of, uh, of discipline in an assembly, particularly the synagogue of, of the time of our Lord Jesus himself, and uh, the principle that is brought out is simply that uh, if there are disputes in the church, that uh, let, let it be handled uh, in the, the local church. And the amplification of this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It really doesn't refer to the church. What is uh, a church? Well, we're going to study that. And we're going to look at it in great detail. So the doctrine of the church, the first point, point one, or point A, is an introduction. Let me say that in, in this introduction, it is very, very important. And that is this, that there were two separate, dissimilar, and yet unmistakable revelations that were given from God to the Apostle Paul. The first was that through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, a perfect eternal salvation is offered to both Jew and Gentile alike on the sole condition of faith in his finished work on the cross. Totally apart from merit on the part of the individual based entirely on the grace of God. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear in Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12, where he says, I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preached is not something that man made up. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And then in the first uh, verse before that passage, the most severe warning in Scripture is issued by the Apostle Paul against all who would pervert this gospel in any way. And he says, but even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we have preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, and so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel, other than what you have accepted, let him be eternally condemned. The gospel of faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. Martin Luther discovered this uh, during the Reformation period, uh, rediscovered it, because the gospel had been lost to view during the dark centuries of Roman corruption and was only recovered during the Reformation period. However, the Reformers did not go far enough for they did not discover the second revelation that was provided uh, to the Apostle Paul by our Lord and Savior by revelation. For I said, remember, two sim separate, dissimilar, and unmistakable revelations were given to the Apostle Paul. The second of these revelations was that God has a purpose for this present age and that is to produce a wholly new and different organism, the church, 
which would be formed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 6, we read, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. The word dis administration is translated dispensation in the King James Version, and it comes from the Greek word oikonomia. Now, that comes from, that's a compound word. Oikos is uh, the word for household, and namas is the word for law, the law of the household. It is uh, a reference to a dispensation or an administration of uh, the revelation of God. So Paul says, you have heard about the administration or the dispensation of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the sacred secret mystery, mystery or mysterion, the sacred secret made known to me by revelation as I have already written briefly in the first chapter. In reading this then, verse 4 continues, you will be able to understand my insight into the sacred secret of Christ. Now verse 5, which was not made known to men in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Now remember that this information was not given prior to the revelation given to the Apostle Paul and the other Apostles. There is absolutely no church in the Old Testament. The covenant theology will teach you that uh, the church began in Abraham's tent. Nothing could be further from the truth. There are sometimes reputable Bible teachers who will try to extrapolate church truth from the Old Testament. It isn't found there. The beautiful story of the Song of Solomon is not about Christ and his church. It's about the Shulamite woman who was true and faithful to her shepherd lover in spite of all of the advances of the wealthy, handsome, powerful Solomon. But you see, people are consistently erroneous in their hermeneutic and there as a result they teach erroneous information. This was according to the Apostle Paul something which was not known in previous generations. Now he describes what it is in verse 6. What is this sacred secret? Here it is. This sacred secret is that through the gospel the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel members together of one body and sharers together in the promise of Jesus Christ. As I said, the Reformers did not recover this truth as it was formerly held by the early church. And there has been a deplorable neglect of this second revelation. Theologians bound and confined within the limitations of Reformation theology have avoided what to them seems to be new. This is not new. No theology would be complete without exalting the first of these Pauline revelations. It is also true that no theology is complete without proper emphasis on the second. No, the two revelations are actually, beloved, inseparable. Now we will study more about Reformed theology, but the great reform, the great error of Reformed theology is the failure to distinguish Israel from the church resulting in a multitude of errors and heresies. We'll deal with one of the whole points that we're going to be dealing with has to do with this, the distinction between Israel and the church. But with that introduction, now let's look at point B, the biblical nomenclature, the meaning and usage of the word church. Actually, the word church is from the Greek word Kuriakos looks like this, K-U-R-I-A-K-O-S. Kuriakos means belonging to the Lord. But it does not define the word. The Greek word, which is translated church in the New Testament, is the word ekklesia. Looks like this, E-K, 
K L A T A S I A, ecclesia. This is a compound word. Note E K ek meaning out and kaleo meaning to call or to summon. Now, the meaning of any word is determined by its usage. Ecclesia was first used in the Attic Greek for an assembly of citizens convened to conduct the affairs of state. They were summoned out from the whole population to transact this business. They were a select portion of the population. The public place where this group of people met uh, also used the word for the gathering place. They were called together by a kerux, a K-E-R-U-X, which is a herald. And it is so used in Acts 19, verses 25 and 32, for the assembly of the Ephesians to handle the problems of their city-state. It was also used for citizens who gathered in the city to conduct business, as you'll see if you study Acts 19.30. In the 2nd century B.C., the uh, Greek-speaking Jews in Alexandria, Egypt, had lost their ability to uh, read and, and speak Hebrew. And therefore, in order to give them some uh, uh, the scriptures, the scriptures were translated into uh, Greek. This is called, it was done by 70 scholars, and so it is called the Septuagint and is often uh, indicated by the Roman numerals LXX, which, as you know, stands for 70. But uh, in the Septuagint, uh, which is the Old Testament, this word was used for the assembly of Israel in Acts 7.38. The Hebrew word was kahal, Q-A-H-A-L, for an assembly or congregation. When the Alexandrians were translating the Hebrew into the Greek for the Septuagint, they had two words to contend with. That was the first word, kahal. The second word was ada, A-D, uh, well, begin, ayin, A-D-A-H, which means a gathering, a crowd, or a family gathering, and is translated congregation, company, swarm, or multitude. Now, in the uh, Septuagint, Ada was translated more than 100 times by the Greek word soon agoge. Soon agoge is the word from which we get in the English synagogue for the U becomes a Y and it's transliterated in that way. And soon agoge means to bring together and could refer to any gathering or bringing together of persons or things. It is transliter transliterated in the English as I said as synagogue. Now Ada is never translated by ecclesia. Kahal, however, is translated 25 times by the word sunagoge and 70 times by ecclesia. So you see there's no consistency to the translation that these 70 used in the Septuagint. But it was uh, definitely used for the assembly of the Jews in their place of study. Now the synagogue came into existence during the dispersion for you see, once the, uh, uh, the temple was torn down and the Jews were taken uh, into captivity uh, and uh, shipped off uh, uh, to uh, uh, Macedonia, to the, I mean to uh, Persia, when they were uh, removed by the Chaldeans, there was no provision in any of the law for a temple except to be in Jerusalem. Therefore, the Jews, in order to form a place for study, formulated uh, a gathering place, which they called the synagogue, the synagogue. And this was the assembly of the Jews. Uh, and 
as I already indicated in Matthew 18, 17, the two or three are gathered, was used for the assembly of the Jews in their synagogue. Uh, the issue of uh, discipline in the church is not taught here. This has nothing to do with the church today. It applied to the Jewish synagogue, as I have clearly uh, indicated to you. Uh, now, the usage of this word, ecclesia, is twofold. First of all, it is used for the church universal, composed of all members of the royal family of God. All believers in this dispensation of the church age from the day of Pentecost to the day of the rapture of the church are a part of the church universal and is usually designated with a capital C. The other is that when a group of capital C church people gather together in any form at any time they become a local church, small c. We'll deal with that at a later time. But the principle of the church universal, judging from the uh, usage of the word, uh, has several connotations. First of all, uh, the members of the church universal are distinct from other people. Secondly, they are called out from their private homes and businesses for the purpose of studying of the word of God. Thirdly, this is a divine calling. Acts 15, 14 is, uh, is quoting is, uh, where uh, 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 Paul says, Simon has described to us how God at first showed his concern by taking from the Gentiles a people for himself. This is the calling out of a people for his own name. An important usage of the group then of, the, of uh, this word is in the secondary sense is when a group of believers uh, who are members of the church universal in a geographical area gather together in one place they become a local church uh, seven uh, it is used for occasions when a group of, of believers in a particular geographical location get together even as few as two people uh, such a group was called a local church, as in 1 Corinthians 11:18, 1 Corinthians 14, 19, 28, and 34 to 35, Philippians 4:15, 1 Thessalonians 1:1, 1, 1, 2 Thessalonians 1:1, 1, 1, and Revelation 2:3. We'll discuss this again further. Any member, any person who is born again during this age of the church is church with a capital C, a member of the royal family of God, a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior, point nine, is the ruler of the church. Uh, it is you as an individual that he rules or does not rule, depending upon your own volition. He's your ruler. But whether he's allowed to function in your life as your ruler depends upon whether you understand and apply the pertinent doctrines. Uh, will, you, will you bother to learn these things or will you not? If you understand this doctrine, you have the basis for submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ as the prince ruler of the local church. And if you're advancing in the spiritual life by living under the control or the filling of God the Holy Spirit, then you have accepted the authority of Jesus Christ as the ruler of the church. Unfortunately, the majority of Christians have rejected our Lord's authority as the ruler of the church. Point 10. Jesus Christ has delegated authority for the communication of doctrine in the local church to the pastor teacher. And if believers have rejected the authority of Jesus Christ over their personal lives, they will obviously reject the authority of any pastor who communicates the word of God, the mind of Christ. Without knowing doctrine, we cannot accept the authority of Jesus Christ. And all local churches are under the authority of a pastor, whether the pastors are absent or present. 
And let me say emphatically, there is no biblical authority for plurality of elders, that is, more than one pastor in a local church. And whether the pastor teaches face-to-face -face is not the issue. His authority may come in some other form of communication. But the type of teaching does not determine whether or not the organization is a local church. It is simply the gathering together of a group of believers. Now when I say that the pastor teacher is the pastor, is the authority of the local church, I say this, he does not have any authority over the individual lives of the believers. Every believer lives his life as unto the Lord. The prince ruler of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ, and every believer lives his life unto that ruler. But as far as the policy of the local congregation, this is determined by the policy of the pastor teacher, the communicator of Bible doctrine in that church. And he establishes authority by the teaching of word by word, verse by verse, from the original languages of Scripture, thus saith the Lord. And if he cannot say, thus saith the Lord, he has no business being a pastor teacher in a local church. Because he is uh, therefore imposing an authority which he does not have because he does not have the word of God to communicate. Point 11, a technical study of believers between Pentecost and the rapture, who at salvation enter into union with Jesus Christ through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, comprises, comprises the balance of this study of the doctrine of the church. You are the church universal. And in its relationship to Jesus Christ, the church is called the body of Christ on earth. It is called the bride of Christ when it gets to heaven and then it will be completed. Now, before we go on to anything else, we must move into a distinction between Israel and the church. There are many similarities between Israel and the church. But remember, points of likeness do not establish a unity. The United States and Great Britain have remarkable likenesses in their laws, but they are not one, but two nations. The same thing is true of Israel and the church, and there are several things that they have in common. First of all, Israel and the church have an acceptable standing on the part of man before God. Second, they have a manner of life consistent with that standing. Thirdly, they have a divinely appointed service. Fourth, a righteous ground whereupon God may graciously forgive and cleanse the sinner. Fifth, they each, they both have a clear revelation of the responsibility on the human side on which divine forgiveness and cleansing may be secured. Sixth, they have an effective basis on which God may be worshipped and petitioned in prayer. And finally, both have a future hope. You see, here's where covenant theology makes a very grievous mistake. Because of the similarities, they will assume that Israel is the Old Testament church. Now, you see, what happens then is, instead of making a distinction between Israel and the church, and setting aside the church as being unique, they take and say the New Testament church is... Is the, is the same as the Old Testament Israel, and Israel is the same as the New Testament church, and therefore all of the promises which are made to Israel are fulfilled in the church. And this causes fantastic heresies. For you see, Israel has covenants, several covenants, five to be exact. And these covenants are specifically given to the Jews. And they will be fulfilled in the future when once again God takes up his dealing with the people of Israel. But not doing so, not separating this, not understanding this, covenant theology comes across with spiritualizing scripture. That is, they have to say, well, it doesn't mean exactly what it says. It, uh, there's a spiritual meaning behind it. And covenant theology is based upon this gross uh, uh, doctrinal error of spiritualizing Scripture. And as a result of this, they do terrible despot to Scripture. Now I'm going to give you contrasts between Israel and the church. 
several of them, and don't be confused because there are so many of them. I'm going to give them to you. Uh, these, by the way, are originally from Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer in his Systematic Theology. But you have uh, seven similarities between Israel and the church, but you have many, many more contrasts. And I'll just go down them. A, the extent of biblical revelation. Israel consists of four-fifths of the Bible. The church, one-fifth. Uh, B, divine purpose. Israel has earthly promises in the covenants. The church has heavenly promises in the gospel. As far as the seed of Abraham is concerned, Israel is the physical seed of whom some do become the spiritual seed. The church is the spiritual seed of Abraham because of faith. By birth, Israel is, physical birth produces a relationship. For the church, spiritual birth brings a relationship. E, inheritance. Uh, earthly, uh, Israel has an earthly and a future uh, uh, inheritance. Whereas the church has an immediate as well as a heavenly uh, inheritance. F, headship. Israel's head is Abraham. The head of the church is the Lord Jesus Christ. G, as far as covenants are concerned. Israel had the Abrahamic and following covenants and a future new covenant. The church has a new covenant which immediately guarantees divine grace for all believers. As far as nationality is concerned, Israel was one nation, but the church is from all nations and actually has no earthly citizenship. I, divine dealing. Israel was dealt with nationally. The church is dealt with individually and personally. As far as dispensations are concerned, Israel is seen in the dispensation of the patriarchs and in Israel, the, the dispensation of Israel. The church is seen only in this present dispensation of the church age and it is totally unrelated to dispensations before or after. As far as ministry is concerned, Israel was to be a witness to the world by people passing through their land, but no missionary activity. It was extremely self-centered worship and there was no gospel. One had to become a Jew to first in order to be related to God. The church, on the other hand, has a commission to take the gospel to the entire world, to those of all nationalities. As far as the death of Jesus Christ is concerned, Israel is guilty nationally and will be saved by it. The church is currently saved by the death of Jesus Christ. M, regarding the Father, Israel, by, by peculiar relationship, God was the Father to the nation, but not to individual Israelites. The church as the begotten of God, each individual is related to God as his Father. As far as Jesus Christ is concerned, Israel uh, considered him their Messiah, their Emmanuel, their King. The church considers him Savior, Lord, Bridegroom, and Head. The Holy Spirit, Israel, uh, under the uh, Israel, the Holy Spirit came upon occasional individuals temporarily. As far as the church is concerned, all believers are permanently indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. The governing principle uh, of uh, Israel is the Mosaic Law. The governing principle of the church is entirely a grace system. Point a Q, enabling power, Israel had none. The church has divine omnipotence available to all believers to execute the superhuman requirements. Our farewell discourses by our Lord. Israel received the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 23, 37 to Matthew 25, 46. The church received the Upper Room Discourse, John chapters 13 through 17. Uh, point S, the promise of the return of Jesus Christ will be to Israel in power and glory for judgment. Deuteronomy 30 verses 1 to 8, Jeremiah 23 verses 7 and 8. The promise to the church is uh, to rapture the church to himself. John 14, 1 to 3. Point T, uh, Israel, according to Isaiah 41, 18, is a servant. The church, according to John 15, 15, is no longer a, a servant, but a friend. And according to John 1, 12, uh, we are children of God. 
Some point you, Christ's earthly reign. Israel will be the subject, according to Ezekiel 37, verses 21 to 28. The church will be co-reigners with Jesus Christ, according to Revelation 20, verse 6. Regarding priesthood, Israel had a priesthood, the Levitical priesthood. The church is a priesthood. Subpoint W, marriage, Israel was an unfaithful wife. The church is the bride of Christ. As far as judgments are concerned, Israel must face judgment, Ezekiel 20, verses 33 to 44. The church is delivered from all judgment, Romans 8, 1. And finally, why? Position in eternity, Israel will be the spirits of just men made perfect in the new earth. The church will be the church of the firstborn in the new heavens, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. This, the next uh, point that uh, needs to be made here is that the church is an intercalation. Now, an intercalation is the insertion of a day or a period of time into a calendar. The church age is inserted into the, the, uh, the time line of the plan of God. The church age actually interrupts the age of Israel. And it interrupts the age of Israel seven years short of its compl completion. The church uh, will function until the day of the rapture, and after the rapture of the church, God will once again take up his dealing with the, his people Israel for a period of seven years, which is known as the tribulation period. The reason for this interruption of the church at the age of Israel is the glorification of Jesus Christ. The age of Israel must be interrupted so that God can call out a people for his own name a royal family to be identified with Jesus Christ forever. The church was future to our Lord's ministry on the earth. Notice Matthew 16, verse 18. The Lord Jesus speaking to Peter says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Will is the future active indicative, which has two connotations. First of all, it de demonstrates future. It also demonstrates certainty. So the, he will build his church future to Matthew chapter 16, 18. And that future time, of course, was uh, uh, the day of Pentecost. And it began with the baptism of the Holy Spirit because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the way God is building his church, making his church. And that took place on the day of Pentecost. Acts 1.5, our Lord gave the promise. He said, for John baptized with water, but in a few days, that would be the day of Pentecost, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12.13 explains, For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. While the words baptism of the Spirit are not mentioned in Acts 2 verses 1 to 3 where it actually takes place, in Acts 11 verses 15 and 16 we are told what took place in Acts 2, 1 to 3 when it occurred. And Acts 11, 15 and 16 says, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So very definitely the baptism of the Holy Spirit began for the first time on the day of Pentecost. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit had absolutely nothing to do with speaking in tongues. The speaking in tongues was a sign to the uh, be, uh, people who were gathered in Jerusalem that this uh, was a supernatural, superhuman thing that was taking place. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is simply when God the Holy Spirit takes the unbeliever who goes positive uh, at the point of God, gospel hearing, 
and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ makes his faith efficacious for salvation and at that same moment uh, he enters that believer into union with Jesus Christ forever and ever and ever. That believer is in Jesus Christ and under no circumstance can he ever in any way ever lose that, uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But it is unique to the church age. It, it, it did not take place in the Old Testament and it will not take place after the rapture of the church. So the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is most unique. And of course it has been perverted by the charismatics and taken a, the, the real significance has been removed from it which is the work of Satan who wants to remove the glorious teaching of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is really about. Now let me give you four reasons the church began on the day of Pentecost. First of all, there could be no church before the death of Jesus Christ because the church is wholly based on his finished work at the cross. Second, there could be no church before his resurrection from the dead because his resurrection provides life to the church. Thirdly, there could be no church until his ascension to be its head and to be its intercessor and advocate in heaven. And fourthly, there could be no church until the Holy Spirit came because he is the one who is forming the church. And the church of God is the habitation of God through the Holy Spirit. And these are all declared to take place after Pentecost. Notice John 12, 16. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. And John 7:39, talking about the, uh, the salvation, by this he meant the Spirit uh, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So there's the beginning of the, the church, the day of Pentecost, never before. Does that tell you something, beloved, by the way, in passing, just uh, about the Gospels? Most of the information contained in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not church truth. It is related to the hypostatic union of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he lived under the Mosaic law. The, 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 the uh, dispensation of, of uh, Israel was not interrupted until the day of Pentecost, and therefore most of the information in the Gospels does not refer to the church. It talks about the precedent for the church in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. But most of the teaching is related to the Old Testament. There are a few passages, Matthew 13 and John 13 through 17, where we, we, we meet the church. But otherwise, uh, the Gospels are silent regarding the church. And don't make the mistake of, of confusing that when you study the Gospels. Now the termination of the church age will be the rapture of the church, which is described for us in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18, where the Apostle Paul says, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep, or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to our Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. See also Colossians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. The body of Jesus Christ, the church, his royal family, will be completed 
when the number of believers in the royal family equals the number of demons operating under Satan. Then each believer following the second coming of Christ to this earth has the privilege of bumping one demon off the earth and into the lake of fire to demonstrate the fantastic grace of God in taking an inferior creature, mankind, and exalting him higher than the superior creature, the angels. So that each believer is an object lesson to that demon that God's grace is absolutely fantastic. This is uh, uh, drawn from Colossians 2.15 compared with Revelation 19 verses 6 to 8 in the Greek with the Hebrew of Zechariah 13.2. And this, the rapture of the church, ushers in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. At the rapture, the church is transferred to heaven via resurrection. The body of Christ is now completed. The church becomes the bride of Christ, which is prepared for the second coming. This preparation is threefold. First, we are given a resurrection body. Second, our old sin nature is removed, Philippians 3.21. And third, the destruction of all human good, uh, which we have accumulated while here on the earth, 1 Corinthians 3.15. And then we need to look finally in talking about the distinction between Israel and the church, only the theological system known as dispensationalism explains the distinction between Israel and the church. I have a complete study guide uh, and notes on the subject of dispensationalism, and I encourage you to write for this book. If you uh, do not understand, if you do not know what the doctrine of dispensationalism is all about. The best I can do is to just give you a review uh, in these moments that we have uh, here. All right. I'm going to give you uh, the, uh, a, brief, a brief synopsis of the uh, doctrine of dispensationalism and why it uh, makes or explains the distinction between Israel and the church. First of all, Dispensationalism is based on the literal interpretation of Scripture, and it is the only system that has this basis. Now, this doesn't mean that there are no allegories or other figures of speech in the Bible, but these are clearly indicated. Uh, for example, when the Lord Jesus Christ says, Herod uh, the fox, he's not referring to the f furry, four-legged creature with the bushy tail. Obviously, it's a figure of speech. But covenant theology claims that behind everything stated in Scripture is a hidden spiritual meaning which must be discovered, which leaves a great deal to the interpreter who is reading into something that isn't there nor was it ever intended to be there. Dispensational theology says that the Bible means what it says literally and must be interpreted with reference to the literal grammatical, historical study of the original text, which is why it is so important that you understand what the hermeneutic of your pastor is before you hook up with a local church. You don't go to find the end of your search for a friendly church. You don't go to find a church where you can meet a mate. You go where the Word of God is taught under dispensational theology. And make sure that he sticks to dispensational theology. There are a lot of guys who say they do it and say they believe it, but they're not consistent in their hermeneutic. Believing in the literal interpretation of Scripture, therefore, re results in the second unique characteristic of dispensationalism, and that the Bible is divided into discernible periods or eras in which God's revelation to the human race and administration of the earth differed. While salvation has always been the same by faith in the revealed person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus Christ, God has nevertheless dealt with the human race in different ways. The scripture definitely identifies at least four dispensations uh, uh, very, very clearly. For example, in 1 Corinthians 9.17, the Apostle Paul says, if I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I, simply, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. Now, the word trust, well, that's not a bad translation for 
oikonomia, as I've already told you the word, O-I-K-O-N-O-M-I-A-S, oikonomias, uh, which is the word for dispensation. And uh, so what Paul is talking about uh, in the context is obvious that he is referring to the dispensation of the gospel which has been uh, 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 given entrusted to him, see? Ephesians 1.10 says, talks of the dispensation of the fullness of times. It obviously speaks of a future administration. Ephesians 3.2, uh, we've already read it. Surely you have heard about the dispensation of God's grace that was given to me for you. So there's three uh, references. You have the, the dispensation of the gospel, the dispensation of the fullness of time, the dispensation of God's grace. And in Colossians 1.24 and 25, Paul talks about the dispensation of the mystery or the sacred secret. And he speaks about a dispensation that preceded this present one. Even our Lord Jesus Christ made it clear that there were changes in the administration of the human race. In John 1.17 he says, For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There you have the difference uh, uh, between uh, two dispensations at least. In Acts 17.30 we read, uh, In the past, a God overlooked such ignorance. Past. But now... He commands all people everywhere to repent. This surely shows that God dealt differently with people in the past than he was currently doing. While the totality of the dispensations are not specifically mentioned, they are clear from a careful study of Scripture. And this is rather amazing because even before the development of either the dispensational or covenant systems of theology, uh, John Calvin himself wrote these interesting words and uh, boy I'll tell you uh, you would think from this that he was certainly a dispensationalist though covenant theology came from John Calvin. This is what he says if a farmer sets aside certain tasks for his household in the winter and other tasks for the summer we shall not accuse him of incon inconstancy or think that he departs from the proper rule of agriculture which accords with the continuous order of nature. In like manner, if a householder instructs, rules, and guides his children in one way in infancy, another way in youth, and still another in young manhood, we shall not on this account call him fickle and say that he abandons his purpose. Why then do we brand God with the mark of inconstancy because he has with apt and fitting mark, mark, distinguished a diversity of times. So, and I'm not going into the uh, dispensations. Uh, you, as I said, if you're interested in finding more about them, what, they na what they're named are and what their characteristics are, you'll find these uh, all in uh, the book uh, Dispensationalism. Because of the literal interpretation of Scripture and the, the, the uh, breaking down into uh, e eons or periods or dispensations of time, uh, a distinction must be made between Israel and the church. As I have said, Israel is not the church in the Old Testament. The promises made by God to the nation of Israel will be fulfilled to the nation Israel. His promises to the church will be fulfilled to the church. Because there are those who are seeking to apply the Old Testament passage related to Israel and its future the church, they have come up with all sorts of weird and false applications of Scripture. This is the source of amillennialism, which is really no millennium, or postmillennialism, which says that Christ returns after the church ushers in the millennium. The truth is that during the dispensation of the church age, God has set aside Israel and is currently calling a peculiar people for his name, and that is the church. Today there are three kinds of people on the face of the earth, Jew, Gentile, and church. Jew and Gentile are both unsaved. The church are all believers, and there's no distinction inside the church between Jew and Gentile, bond or free, male or female. At the rapture of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ will return and remove this unique organism, the church, from the earth. And after that, he will once again deal with the nation of Israel. The fourth distinction of dispensationalism is related to the purpose of God in the world. Covenant theology says that the purpose of God in the world is salvation. 
This sounds very spiritual, but it's not the case. God's purpose in all of the dispensations from the beginning of time to all eternity is to glorify himself. The dispensationalist says that the saving program of God is just one of the many programs in which God is constantly glorifying himself. Now, I'm not going to take a, a great deal of time to go through point C. I'll just uh, iterate them for you. You can read them in your notes. There are several synonyms for the Lord Jesus Christ and his rulership over the church. For example, uh, he is called the last Adam as the ruler of the church. And the church universal is called a new spiritual species. 1 Corinthians 15 45 to 47. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a living spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural. And after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man from heaven. The second man, obviously, our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, Galatians 6.15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. The first Adam was made ruler of the original creation. Because of sin, he forfeited it to Satan. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, though tempted far beyond anything the first Adam experienced, did not sin, and he became the ruler of the new, spirit, new spiritual species, the church. The second analogy is the head and the body. Jesus Christ is the head and the royal family of God is the body. This speaks, of course, of the, the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. The body also emphasizes our differences in personality and spiritual gifts. Yet the body principle indicates the oneness of all of the members, though each plays a different role. Each one plays a different part on the team. And the body is also self-developing. Members of the body are appointed to secure other members. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. There are many other verses, but I'll not go into them. They're in your notes. Three, we have the shepherd and sheep analogy. Like the church, sheep are utterly helpless. They're stupid. They require leadership. They need protection. They must have provision. And while other animals are able to lick their wounds for healing, the sheep cannot do this. Uh, the production of the sheep, uh, the wool, actually belongs to the shepherd and not to the sheep. And they cannot get food for themselves. They must be fed. Our Lord Jesus Christ said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. And he is called uh, the great shepherd of the sheep and the chief shepherd in Hebrews 13, 20 and 1 Peter 5, 4 respectively. Fourthly, he, the vine and branches analogy is brought out in 15 of John, verses 1 to 6, where the Lord says, I am the uh, vine, my father is the gardener, he cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes and so that it will become more fruitful. We find the analogy for a positional truth. The vine and the branches partake of one common life. Growth and improvement come through discipline. And the production of the branches is the believer's advance to spiritual maturity. Five, the concept of Christ as the chief cornerstone and the stones in the building as the church was first taught by Christ in Matthew 16, verses 16 through 18. Uh, then uh, we also find it in Ephesians 2:20, 20, uh, 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 8. Six, the analogy of the high priest and the royal priesthood is found in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Hebrews 10.10-14. 10 and by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But... When this priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. 
Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Seventhly, we have the groom and the bride analogy, which is found in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2. Uh, and again in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, and in Revelation 19, verses 16 to 8. This eschatological analogy speaks of the future of the church as the royal family of God. It will not be fulfilled until the second advent at the wedding feast of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when we are forever united with him. The church, the bride, will have been prepared at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, and uh, then we are perfect and we are united with him forever and ever. We shall continue the doctrine of the local of the church uh, in our next study. Now, thank you, loving Father, for this time together. May God, the Holy Spirit, take this very pedantic subject and yet make it living and, uh, and exciting to those who are listening and who are seeking to grow in grace through the means of this study. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Thank wow.